New York City, as the people not only were strewing the pathway with clothing, but also with palm branches. And also we're told in some of the records that they were waving these palm branches as they were lined up on the street and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now there are differences among scholars as to the etymological derivation of the word Hosanna. We use it as a term of exaltation, as a term of adoration, and certainly it was used in that manner on this day outside of Jerusalem as Jesus was approaching the city. But the ancient tradition is that palm branches were not called palm branches, but they were called hosannas probably not originally or not for certain, but the idea was that, that the, the hosanna or the palm branch was used to signify a great victory. And so as a means of celebrating a great victory, the people would wave the hosannas. And then they began to use the word Hosanna as a shout of acclamation and as a shout of victory. Now that's the significant thing here, that the palm branch signified victory. Now here comes the king. And already the people are celebrating the victory they believe this king will win for them. We often hear sermons on Good Friday about the fickleness of the mob who just a few days before were screaming their lungs out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and now they're screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And we're often told that that radical change in attitude can only be explained by a profound disappointment among the masses because their expectations were not met. If you want to see people get angry, create expectations and fail to meet them. And that's presumably what happened on that occasion. But now let's just keep in mind for the moment the significance of this public acclamation and celebration of victory with the use of the palm branches. Now, if we go back for a moment to Luke's version, we read that when the people were uh, gathered in verse 37 of, of chapter 19 of Luke, uh, we read that as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Again, conflict arises. Jesus is enjoying this public display of welcome by the citizenry of Jerusalem the people who heard him gladly. The multitude are singing and cheering and praising him as he comes. But the religious establishment is upset by this. They regard Jesus as a heretic, as a threat to the order and to their teaching. And so he rebu they rebuke Jesus and they say, Teacher, tell your people here to be quiet. Tell them to shut up. And according to Luke's gospel, we read, But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. I love that answer by Jesus. Because we are told frequently in the New Testament about the cosmic significance of Christ's kingship. 
that he's not simply the leader of a little religious group, but remember his central message has been the breakthrough of the kingdom of God. And it is God's appointed king who is entering into Jerusalem. And he's not simply the king of the church. He is not simply the king of kings. That is, the imperial authority over all earthly rulers. And he's not simply the Lord of lords. But in New Testament categories, he is a cosmic king. That his rule extends over all of the earth. And as Paul tells us, the whole creation groans together in travail, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And it is typical in the Old Testament prophets, uh, among the Old Testament prophets, to hear them rebuke the people for being blind and dumb, for failing to recognize the manifestation of God in their midst and failing to hear and perceive the truth of the Word of God. And in that prophetic rebuke, the prophets would say, the ox knows his master and so on, and the animals, the dumb brutes that we call them, are much more responsive and sensitive to the appearance of God and obedient to the laws of God than you are. And Jesus uses this same kind of imagery here when he said, listen, if I silence my disciples, the earth won't be able to contain itself. The cosmos is going to have to break out in celebration and acclamation. These stones would have, and obviously what Jesus is implying is that have more sense than you do, Pharisees, that these stones will begin to cry out and burst forth shouting, Hosanna. And at this point, the Pharisees can't stop it. I mean, it's, it, the thing has, has reached a crescendo of excitement. If you've ever been to Jerusalem. If you haven't ever been to Jerusalem, get there and, and, and get a sense, a feel for the setting of so much of biblical history. But if you go to the Mount of Olives, which overlooks the city of Jerusalem, and I don't know the exact distance from the Mount of Olives to the gate, uh, I believe it's the East Gate, of Jerusalem, that is, as the crow flies. But you certainly, if you're standing on the Mount of Olives, you certainly have the feeling that if you were George Washington, you could take a silver dollar and throw it across the valley into the city. Now, it's, about, it's over a mile when you go in the circuitous route down the side of the Mount of Olives and around the Valley of Kidron and work your way back up to the entrance to the walls of Jerusalem. But as the crow flies, it's very very short. But the procession begins on the Mount of Olives and wind its way down, winds its way down the mountainside, around the valley, and then into the gates of the city. And so it takes a, more than a few minutes to make this route, and we can get this sensation of an ever-increasing multitude as Jesus comes closer and closer to the city, and he is received as a conqueror, not only as a king, but as a conquering king, a victorious king. Now, one of the things that we didn't discuss when we looked at the intertestamental period was the writing of those books that are included in the canon of the Old Testament, 